Good morning. Happy to see everyone again. Another beautiful day in New York City, though it's going to be a scorcher. I probably won't be going out much, but you know that doesn't matter to me. I'll read. Now that I don't have the pandemic that's really keeping me indoors, I can read and I can learn and I can teach. On Thursdays, if you'll remember, I've undertaken a course to teach you live on YouTube about our national labor relations laws. When I got involved, I got this huge tome from, uh, I just noticed it, it says the U.S. Department of Labor timeline, alternate version, then, now, and next. Well, I guess I haven't gotten to the, then I've gotten to, now I'm just getting into, and next, not so much. But as I was reading this article, which led me to reading the Powell Doctrine, August 23rd, 1971. I thought that was really all I needed to know. Well, in a way, it is. The Powell Doctrine is a doctrine about the rise of corporate power in America. If you'd been living in a cave and just woke up, you'd know that we were in the midst of a second Gilded Age. And I think you can thank a lot of that to the Powell Doctrine. Lewis Powell, who eventually was nominated to the Supreme Court by Richard Nixon, wrote this doctrine because he thought American corporations were losing power to labor in America. That for him was a tragedy. That for him was everything. And it looks like it's everything to the Supreme Court, to the conservative movement, to many of the Republicans in power today. It's all about the money, folks. Reminds me of my ex-partner who used to think his money was his money and my money was his money too. So I understand the concept. I may not like it, but I certainly understand it. And that's how corporate power feels today. When you've got folks making 6,000 times the national average of their medium employee, well, you got to say, all the money is floating to the top, right? And the folks on the bottom, not so much. 400 of our wealthiest people own the amount that the 50% own. 400 people. So we're not talking a lot of people dominating our lives. It's just that the majority has been silent. And the majority is going to have to use the exact same tactics that the minority uses. Litigation. Litigation is the way to go on class action suit levels. Whether it's for forming a union, whether it's for protesting pollution in your neighborhood, or the latest pipeline that came through and contains benzene and other toxics that are carcinogenic, or sue the folks who are trying to ban women's right to reproduction and their rights to freedom, freedom of choice for themselves. Because before you know it, everyone's going to lose their rights. And if we don't stand up, folks, it's just going to be like that old rhyme, right? When they came for me, there was no one left because no one stood up in the beginning for everyone else 
as they were losing their rights. So let's look at what the Supreme Court has done in the last week, because I think it's memorable. They've closed the year out saying, we did everything on our plate that we were supposed to do. We've wiped the slate clean. Well, it included a hell of a lot of things that they shouldn't have done to begin with and what they promised not to do ever. Roe v. Wade, I remember John Roberts saying he's an incrementalist. He wouldn't just take away all those rights that we've enjoyed for 50 years. But they did, the court did, in a 6-3 decision. And what does it mean? It means that others have to go to court to enjoin the states and make sure that they don't implement these absolute bans. And some of those bans may not even be constitutional. So this is going to be long and drawn out for no reason, except it costs money and it costs pain and it costs lives. I didn't hear the Supreme Court ruling that, oh, if 32,000 kids are born and maybe they're born to people who don't have a lot of income, well, we're giving a safety net to all of those folks and everyone else who has more children that they think that they can afford. So we're giving them childcare, we're giving them pre-K, we're giving them schooling, breakfasts, lunches, dinners if they need it, whatever, and a great education and great health care so that those youngsters who are born can really survive and thrive. That, to me, I didn't hear from the Supreme Court, but it should. If you're fighting for life, well, then we should be fighting for the best life we can have. And that means the best health care, the best education, best places to live as well. But they didn't do that, no. Just like they didn't do that when they considered open carry laws in our states where we've expressly said, we don't want them because we've got too many folks living in New York City alone. We don't want guns on subways or buses or anywhere in a public sphere. And let's face it, New York City is almost all a public sphere. Once you step out of that isolated apartment of yours, you're mingling with the public. Make no mistake about it. Well, maybe we can go a step further here in New York and make sure that the liability laws are in place and background checks are in place and whatever else we deem necessary to keep the public safe because the public isn't safe now. And black women who are being abused by their husbands and shot to death, they're not safe either. Nor are kids on the street who may be caught in the crossfire of someone else's anger. They're not safe either. So good job, Supreme Court. You didn't protect the public, but you sure as hell protected the corporations. They can keep on advertising how good they are. They can sell those AR-15s at 2,000 bucks a pop and God knows how much for those long magazines that they put into them. That can sell, just like we have no problem selling opioids to the masses. And when Malincourt says, well, it was somebody else that did it, look, they all knew how many pills they were selling. They knew how many Americans lived in America. And when you're selling billions of pills, that means you're selling it to billions of people or to millions of people enough times to cause an overdose. You could have known better. You didn't care. And it's the same thing with the guns. 
you could have known better, but it was so much easier to act on impulse, so much easier to support the corporations. And now we have the latest one, which was a no-brainer in most courts. If it was a Supreme Court, it should have been thrown out of court immediately. This is based on a law in the EPA that never went through. There is no law. The only thing, and it's a big thing, that the Supreme Court accomplished, what they accomplished is they said the EPA cannot make standards on emissions. Well, that's kind of stupid. That's the job of the EPA, is to look at emissions and make standards and make sure that we don't have so much pollution in our country that people are dying from polluted waters, from polluted air, from polluted crops. But what does the Supreme Court feel about that? They're on that court for life. They've been bought and paid for by who knows. One instance, though, I do know. Neil Gorsuch, he was bought and paid for by Ansuch. I remember because I wrote a letter, evidently, to John McCain, may he rest in peace, who answered me and said, in this instance, he was supporting Neil Gorsuch, and he wrote me the reasons why, but he said he'd listen to me on other issues. I did write back to John McCain. I wrote back to him on health care, and he did, even though he was dying, vote yes to the Affordable Care Act. But I digress and such. Money comes from oil wells, and he's a deep conservative, and he owns the Washington Examiner. So how does this all play into the Powell Doctrine, you may ask? Because it all does. It all goes back to it. It's corporate power. Corporate power without restraint. When they say at the Supreme Court they're supporting states' rights, well, they're supporting some states' rights. Those states who want to give us coal emissions and black lung disease, who want to pollute the atmosphere even more than it's polluted so we can heat up even more. When it reaches 93 degrees here in New York City, I can't go out. I'm lucky, though. I have air conditioning. However, I'm not looking at the rest of the country and how many crops are failing because of the heat or how many cattle are dying because of the heat or how my food is changing because of the heat. I'm not tasting when I buy from the supermarket delicious apples or delicious tasting melons or even sweet potatoes. They all have kind of a bland, not too much flavor taste. That's not what I grew up with. When I ate a melon, it was succulent and juicy and, and sweet. The one I just got, it's got no flavor at all. When I go to the farm stands, because they grow them locally, I can still get that kind of melon and I can still get those apples. Big Agra at being subsidized at 20 billion a year, they're not gonna give us that. They're gonna give us stuff that's quick and easy so that they can keep destroying the land that they've been given. And then they're given the tax breaks besides for owning all that land. So we subsidize them with the one hand and then we subsidize them through taxation with the other. 
There's got to be a way to stop that, guys. You want money? You want money for minimum wages? And by the way, it hasn't come at the federal level, but 20 states as of July 1st today are going to have an increased minimum wage anywhere from 10.50 an hour to 16.10. According to the Bureau of Labor and Statistics, if that 725 wage that was given way back when it was, I don't even remember when, was looked at today, it would be the equivalent of 2050. Well, 2050 may be what everyone needs as a minimum wage. That's about 800 a week, and that is a living wage for everyone during this time of inflation where people shouldn't have to have three jobs just to support themselves. Which brings me to where do we go after the Supreme Court? How do we use the rule of law? And how do we get people back to a clean slate for workers? This was developed, here it is. This was developed by a group at Harvard in the Working Life and Law Division. And it was signed on to by other professors, unions, and corporations who are truly interested in the ESGs, corporations that care about the environment and the health and well-beings of their workers and their communities. So, yes, there's bad news, but we're a country of law, and we're a country that looks at bad news as opportunities. And I think, contrary to the prognosticators, things won't have to get bad if we put our heads together and act in a pragmatic way. So, God bless you, everyone. See you after the fourth, and hope you have a day of reflection. Take care.